Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Brothers and sisters, I don't normally give sermons a title, but if I were to give today's sermon a title, it would be the word more. The word more. Why? Let us consider for a moment this icon that is before us. We don't have an icon of St. John Climacus. We probably will get one one day. But I put this icon out instead because it represents him. And what you see on this icon is a ladder reaching from earth to heaven, evocative of Jacob's ladder from the Old Testament, where it says it was a ladder that reached from earth to heaven. And at the top, the Lord is welcoming those who are climbing the ladder, rung by rung, to get to the top. Along the way, some of the monks and priests and bishops who are on the ladder make it. Some don't. Some, as they're climbing, are being pulled off by the devil. And you can see it very clearly on the icon. And some of them make it very high up until they get pulled off. Now, what does this mean? This is evocative of the book that St. John Climacus wrote called, appropriately, The Ladder of Divine Ascent. And St. John wrote this for himself and also for his monks. He didn't write it as a handbook for lay people. He wrote it specifically for the monks of his <coughs> monastery, St. Catherine, which is located to this day and still exists in the Sinai Peninsula. St. Catherine's Monastery. It has some of the oldest manuscripts of Christianity known anywhere. Also has some of the oldest icons known anywhere. Many that predate the iconoclast controversy. Also very interestingly, because it was surrounded very early by Islam, very interestingly there is in St. Catherine's Monastery a very large parchment and at the bottom of that parchment on the left-hand side is a palm print. Mohammed couldn't write, he was illiterate. But this parchment, which he dictated, details that he, Mohammed, the founder of Islam, is granting St. Catherine's monastery protection. And because he couldn't sign it, he put his palm print on it. And that document exists to this day and is hung there in the, in the monastery. You can see it if you go there. So let's get back to St. John Climacus. What he tried to instruct his monks in was a way that could fulfill one of the epistles we heard today, but also to fulfill the Lord's commandments for us to be perfect and to be holy. To be perfect and to be holy. Sometimes we might hear that, and we do hear it throughout the year in the readings, and we might say to ourselves, okay, how do we do that? How do we become perfect? How do we become holy? So John wrote this book for his monks, and in it he said that perfection, obtaining perfection, is like climbing a ladder. And as you go rung by rung, you cannot ascend higher until you master the footing of one rung and use that to push yourself up to the next rung. And so he begins by describing these rungs on the ladder, repentance, forgiveness, humility, love, patience, forbearance, and so forth and so on. And he says to his monks, until you master one rung, you cannot move to the next one. There is no pass, go, collect $200 and all of that like a monopoly. You just can't avoid certain things. You have to go rung by rung. And why, why then, would I suggest that today's sermon is called more? Because St. John essentially said to his monks, 
You may think this is impossible, but of course, as the scriptures teach us, we might think it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And that there is a way to achieve divine perfection and holiness. If the Lord were to command us to be perfect and holy, there has to be a way to accomplish it. And by ascending the rungs of this ladder of divine ascent, he reminded them, if you can master the lowest rung and then move to the next one and master that one and then move to the next one, perhaps, eventually, perfection could be yours. And we might think that that's asking a lot. Perhaps waiting years to perfect one rung before we move to the next one. And we might think that's impossible. That's asking a lot of us, being perfect, being holy. See, the Lord always asks more of us. Like today, like during this time of fasting, we are engaged right now in more fasting, more prayer, more services, more almsgiving, more forgiveness toward one another, or at least we should be. And so we can't move from, from one rung to the next. We can't ascend in perfection and holiness until we master the lower rungs. We can't move on to more until we perfected what we have been given, what has been entrusted to us. For example, repentance is at the beginning of everything. And you can't go to the next rung or you can't go to the rung of forgiving others until you understand what it means to be forgiven by God. And once you understand what it means to be forgiven by God, you can understand humility. Once you understand humility and being forgiven, you can understand thankfulness and all of the other things. But there are certain, there's a certain logic to this ladder of divine ascent. We cannot ascend until we comprehend and understand and master the lower rungs, beginning with repentance. And you know, this is going to be probably the first time I've given a sermon in two parts. But I want to say some things now, and I want to say some things at the end of liturgy that pertain to these words that I'm sharing with you right now. But I want to get back to this ladder for just a moment. The church very, very early on, John lived in the 6th century, thereabouts, very early on, the church put John on the Lenten calendar on the fourth Sunday. And even though others, like Polycarp, who was on the third Sunday, were, or the second Sunday, were later replaced by Gregory Palamas, I've explained that to you before, John's been on it since the very beginning, so has Mary of Egypt. And so, there must be something that John has handed down to us, has given us, has left us, that the church has thought is really, really important. Now, the funny thing is, as I mentioned a moment ago, the book he wrote, he wrote to his monks. He didn't write it as a handbook for lay people. And as a matter of fact, there are many, many, many people who think that the latter of divine ascent shouldn't be read by lay people at all, or at least not read without some sort of guidance and so forth. And so because of that, there are books that have been written by clergy, bishops, and even some very educated and knowledgeable lay people about how to read this. Because when you read this, you're going to find that the discipline he lays upon his monks seems and will seem to you overwhelming. Oh my gosh, does he really expect me to do this? No, he didn't expect you to do it. He expected his monks to do it. And monastics are called to a very different kind of severity. They are called to a very different, or a higher level, we might say, a higher standard. They are held to by their abbot and by the Lord himself. Because we have to remember, monks, they engage in this lifestyle willingly. They're not forced into it. They're not dragged into it. I remember talking with some people one time who were going to a monastery, an Orthodox monastery. And they were going to take with them, they had a bag, they were going to take with them, get this, candy bars and chocolates and all kinds of things like that because those poor monks, they don't get to eat any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, because they don't want to eat any kind of that stuff. They have deliberately engaged in this kind of a, of a lifestyle to deny themselves certain things and they don't miss those things. 
You know, most monks go for their entire life in a monastery never eating meat. Never eating meat, pork, chicken, fish, yes. But not a lot of other stuff. They don't eat all that stuff all the time. How do they fast? Imagine. When Lent comes, what do they do? All that stuff they've already denied themselves. So they enter into this willingly. So when John says to them, I want you to be this severe. I want you to be this, this strict with yourself. We might read that and go, oh my gosh, how can anybody attain that? It's not meant for lay people. That's why reading the latter of divine ascent has to be read with a guide, with someone who understands what's been written and what it means and how it applies to us. <clears throat> but there is this overall, this overarching theme this thread that runs through the entire book, <coughs> that you will not be able to master the higher rungs of discipline if you cannot master the lower rungs, because one inevitably leads to the next. As I just explained a moment ago, for example, the idea of repentance and forgiveness. If you repent and you receive forgiveness by, uh, from God, now you understand God's love for you, and hopefully you will be able to then forgive others in forgiving others, there's a joy in that. There's a joy that comes with letting go of those things that hurt you, that have hurt us. There's a joy in letting go of that. And there is a way in which you can move on in the spiritual life that way. And there's a way that you can approach others and forgive them and receive forgiveness from them. It's all tied in together. One rung leads to the next. That's why in Orthodoxy, when we have Lent, we have a period of preparation in pre-Lent. We have the Lenten preparation that prepares us not for Pascha. Lent prepares us for Holy Week, and that's coming up. We can't master, you might say, Holy Week unless we've mastered Lent. And so this idea of taking life one step at a time is the lesson of the ladder of divine ascent. That the ladder, or we might say the path or the way to heaven, represented at the top of the icon right here by Christ welcoming those who are coming up that ladder. You see, you even kind of see where he offers his hand at the very end. What is that evocative of? What does that remind you of? Remember Peter coming out to meet him? Peter walking on water and then becoming afraid of the forces around him, the very forces he was walking on water, conquering, just like the Lord did, and bid him. He said, bid me, Lord, to come walk on water. I bid you come. And he came, and he walked on water. And then when he was overwhelmed by what he saw, he began to sink. And what did God do? Jesus reached down, grabbed his hand, and pulled him up. And that's what's happening at the top here. Jesus is reaching out and welcoming each person who makes it, one by one, up that ladder into the kingdom. What's really frightening about this is the fact that there are many people on this ladder who are being pulled off. And you know what happens to us brothers and sisters quite often may happen every day. We may have to face this kind of thing every day. Where we get pulled off of that narrow path that we're walking, that narrow path which is supposed to lead us to the kingdom of heaven, we get pulled off it daily. We get pulled off it through anger. We get pulled off it through jealousy. We get pulled off it through envy. We get pulled off it through despair and despondency and doubting. By the way, doubting is not a sin. I want you to understand this. Doubting is not a sin. Realizing that you doubt and there's no answers to your doubt or no resolution to your doubt, that could be, because you could then be denying truth. But the fact of the matter is we get pulled off that narrow path, our path, the path that Christ has set before us, we get pulled off that every day. But what we have to be careful of is being pulled off that path and brought into hell. Because when we get pulled off it, when we get tempted, when we, get, when we face trials and tribulations and things like that, we have to ask ourselves, what do we now do? What can we now do? How can we get back on that path? These monks being pulled off that ladder are not going back on that ladder. Once they've fallen, they've fallen. Satan has them. There is no turning back. For many of us, though, there may be a turning back. There may be a resolution. It's called repentance. 
being sorry, sincerely sorry for what we've done, but resolving even further to do something about it. What do we resolve to do about it? We resolve to never do it again. Were we angry? Let's resolve never to be angry again. Were we mad? Did we insult someone? Let's resolve never to get mad and insult that person again. Were we despairing? Let's get back on the path and resolve to keep our eyes focused on Jesus so we can never despair, etc. We get back on the path and we keep going. What we don't do is we don't stay off the path thinking that God doesn't care whether I stay off the path or not. These monks who are falling off that ladder in an allegorical sense, these monks who are falling off that ladder, ma ladder matter very much to God. But the reason they're falling off, the reason they're getting pulled off, is they let themselves be pulled off. Do you see? They let themselves be pulled off. How do you let yourself get pulled off the path to salvation? By staying off the path and not resolving to get back on it. It's like falling off the horse. You've heard that saying probably many, many times. You fall off the horse, you get back again. You stumble, you get up. You fall, you get up. You don't stay down. You get up. Dust yourself off. Make your sign of the cross. Lord, forgive me. And you keep going. And you don't let what pulled you off the path continue to make you stumble and miss what God has in mind for you. God has in mind for us one day to welcome us into that kingdom so that we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy which has been prepared for you since the foundations of the world. That's what we hope to hear up here by him from his mouth. That's what we hope to hear. And we can hear it if we simply realize that there's going to be bumps on the road. There's going to be things that cause us to stumble. There are things that are going to cause us to fall, but we don't stay down there. We get up. We fix what happened. We resolve never to do it again. We apologize if we hurt someone. And we keep going. You see, Satan wants you to be convinced that having fallen off the path, you need to stay there. You're not any good. You're nothing special. God doesn't care about you. Why are you even trying? You shouldn't even be on that path. You're not worthy, etc., etc. He is the liar of all time, the father of lies, and we must not and we must never believe anything that we hear in our heads that would sound like that. Because you have Christ at the top of that ladder, you might say, our own ladder our own path at the end encouraging us and exhorting us keep going get up keep going sometimes it may not be worth it it may not seem like it's worth it sometimes it may seem like it's a lot of work sometimes it may seem like it's very discouraging trial after trial after trial many of us have been there many of us have been there but you know what that's not the, the future. That's not the intention of our Lord. The intention of our Lord is to bring us into heaven. We confess that in the anaphora during liturgy. And you did not cease to do all things until you had brought us up to heaven and had endowed us with your kingdom which is to come. We say that in the anaphora of St. John Chrysostom. So I want you to take away, hopefully, from this part one of this sermon... A sense of hope and a sense that we have things that await us, things that we cannot get, that are not within our grasp yet. But we can see out there in the distance, just like the men climbing this ladder, we can see the Lord's outstretched hand. You're almost there. Keep going. Don't look at what's off the ladder. Don't look at those men in black, you know, flying around with wings ugly and all that. Don't look at them. Look at me. Focus on me. Come to me. And if we do that, brothers and sisters, I believe we all can make it. And that is indeed why we're here. That's indeed why we become Orthodox. That's indeed why we confess Christ the way we do and how we pray the way we do and worship the way we do and take him into us the way we do. Because we think all of this is leading to something, to some place. And that's exactly what it is doing. Keep focused. 
Don't focus on the things that have brought you down. Don't focus on the things that have caused you to weep, that have caused you to question, that have caused you to despair. There is an answer. That answer is Jesus Christ. And he has promised, I will never fail you or forsake you. So while we might fail or forsake each other, he will never do that because he has promised us. And if God makes a promise and can't keep it, then in what are we believing? But God does make promises, and he does keep them. And he is at the end of that ladder. He's at the end of our path. He's looking right at us. His eyes have never taken off us. And he is saying to us, keep going, keep going, keep going, and don't give up.